but yeah. it was actually what made me start water reading water. foreign policy was even a piece of sushi in there. Sushi is a symbol of globalization. It's just great. Well, I can, I can tell we can take this in any number of directions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to welcome everyone. Uh, we're here um, to celebrate the, the appearance of an important book, China's Brave New World. Um, I'm Blair Rubel, for those of you who don't know me. I'm director of the Comparative Urban Studies Project here at the Wilson Center and also the Center's Cannon Institute, which specializes on Russia and Ukraine. Uh, we're very pleased with the Comparative Urban Studies Project to be co-sponsoring this event with our colleagues at the Asia Program and the China Environment Forum. Uh, I particularly want to thank uh, Bob Hathaway and Mark Moore with the Asia Program and Jennifer Turner with the China Environment Forum here at the center. But I want to pay particular attention and thank uh, two people who really have made the event possible. Uh, Allison Garland, who's with the Comparative Urban Studies Project, and Lyndon Ellis, who's with the center's China Environment Forum. They're the people who actually got all of you in this room in various ways, so I want to be sure to thank them. For those of you who don't know the, about the Comparative Urban Studies Project, we're coming to an end of a five-year grant from USAID, and by the end of January, we will release a report on global urban poverty that came out of that project. So you uh, may want to keep an eye out for that. And you can find out about all the programs, the Asia Program, the Urban Program, the China Environment Forum, um, the Kennan Institute, if you're interested in, in Russia either the materials outside or the Wilson Center's website, www.wilsoncenter.org. If you have any questions, you can ask Jennifer or me or Allison's around here someplace as well. Well, I'm very excited because this is a, a wonderful book, and it's an important book, and I'm going to leave that to Jeffrey to convince you all of, but I think the rest of us uh, have, have had a chance to spend some time with it, and. Um, uh, as you'll find out in a moment, it, it really is worth doing so. It's worth tracking down. We have order information available outside uh, for a variety of reasons uh, having to do with the security in this building. The books didn't make it here, but we do have order forms outside, and, and this is what it looks like. You can, I'm sure you can go to Borders and look for, uh, for it as well. Um, we distribute information with speaker bios, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time introducing people you can, you can read about. Uh, Jeffrey, of course, though, traveled the farthest, and I want to thank him for, for making uh, the trip. Uh, Jordan came all the way from Georgetown, which is uh, another universe uh, in and of itself, so we're glad you, you were able to, to make the trip. And it's especially nice to welcome back Wei Ping Wu, who was involved in the origins of the Comparative Urban Studies Project. We, we figured it was over a decade ago. Um, we had a um, working group that prepared a report for the Habitat II conference in Istanbul in 1996. And the book was called Preparing for the Urban Future, Global Pressures and Local Forces. And if you look in it, you'll find a, a really wonderful chapter by Wei Ping, uh, before everybody had discovered her. So uh, we're, we're particularly proud to have her back. And I think with that, I'm simply going to turn the floor over to Jeffrey. Great, great. Well, thank you all for coming, and thank you for that um, wonderfully generous introduction. It's a treat for me to be here. Um, the Wilson Center, I guess before the formal project was um, started, had a conference on urban spaces in post-Mao China, which I came to in the early 90s that then led to a, um, a book out of that. And it was a pivotal event for me because it was the first one as a historian who till that point had thought of myself as working on student protests that happened to take place in cities, being around a group of urbanists from various disciplines. That was a conference that helped switch me to thinking about cities as more than just a place where certain kinds of political or cultural events happen, but is interesting to analyze in their, in their own right. And um, Blair does along with his various administrative accomplishments, wrote two books that, were, uh, that I read s while I was making this transition, both of which were comparative in two different ways, um, one in a sense staying within um, Russia and the other moving between Russia, Japan, and um, the United States in a very um, ambitious and successful way, looking at second cities in three different places. 
it's also, so it's a treat for me to be introduced by Blair and also to be involved with something that Jennifer Turner is one of the co-sponsors of um, her unit because um, I had the good pleasure of teaching her briefly as a substitute teacher for her regular political science professor at Indiana <laughs> University. So in many ways, it's, it's a real treat um, to be here. What I thought I would do is give you a taste of the book rather than trying to summarize um, a lot of the big arguments. I'll actually do, I've been doing readings, uh, and I would do mostly a reading of one chapter, but also talk about some of the um, larger issues of the book very briefly through, I love to show the cover photo. Most of the photos you'll be seeing are photos that I took. This is just a photo that I wish I took. Um, I simply told a colleague of mine at Indiana University, I asked when I was teaching there before I moved to UC Irvine, um, there was a, a colleague in the journalism school who had worked for National Geographic magazine. And I was the director of the East Asian Studies Center and partly with our support he'd made a trip to China. And I said, do you have any photograph you took then that suggests a rapidly changing public sphere in which different kinds of ideas are being talked about or different kinds of media are appearing, but it's not clear whether, um, whether there's new politics going on. Do you have any image that could suggest that? And he gave me this, which I'm just delighted by. And it even has sort of an advertisement for a fast food place, which is something that also figures in the book. There's a lot about how, how food, uh, coffee, as you'll be hearing about, and media can give you a sense of both the degree to which China has been changing and also the limits on that change. So I th I'll start by just showing you, this is a um, table of contents from the book, just talking through very quickly of how cities and comparisons of cities show up in it. Um, burgers, beepers, and bowling alleys is largely about the sort of consumer revolution in Chinese cities, something that I'll talk about in the chapter that I'll be reading, which is number three, All the Coffee in China. Chapter two, Mr. Mao Ringtones, imagines what a revivified Mao would make of Nanjing, um, how it had changed since he was there, and particularly of one of Nanjing's uh, bookstores, in which now the philosophy section has fewer of his books than works by French post-structuralist theorists, such as one titled, perhaps optimistically, Understanding Foucault. Um, <laughs> A lot of people have talked about what would Mao think if he were, came back to life. That's become a common trope. I think I'm the first one to say that one reason I have that fantasy is because he's lying in a glass coffin that reminds me of those that a fairy tale princess lies in while she's awake, waiting to be awake, awoken. So all the coffee in China will be the one I'll be, be reading from. The Generalissimo would not be amused is one kind of comparative topic, comparative chapter. It looks at the city of Taipei which I first went to after going to mainland cities. And so when I went to Taipei, I continually thought, how is this similar to or different from the Chinese cities that I'm familiar with, which are the mainland ones? And one thing that's interesting about that from the perspective of a China specialist is for a whole generational cohort or several generational cohorts, they only were able to go to Chinese mainland cities after having become accustomed to Chinese urban life by going to Taipei where many of them studied Chinese and first got their taste of Chinese city life. So this is reversing the gaze. And I say it's also how many Chinese are now look, coming to Taipei as visitors from the mainland, having um, a sense of what Chinese cities are like from mainland cities. I won't talk through each of the rest of the chapters, except I'll mention there's one, chapter 10, Carl gets a new cap, Budapest in 2000, which um, plays with the idea of moving between, um, between China and Eastern Europe. And that's something that I do in the book in a light way. Um, I, I think it's useful to try to think about Chinese cities <coughs> as post-socialist cities, cities that, in which people have the memory of a time when things were structured in a different way, there was less room for private life, and it, there was more equality. That's not something that I deal with a, at length in the book, but it is um, something I deal with in a Journal of World History article that came out in June is available online that compares specifically Shanghai and Budapest. But a lot of what I do in the book is compare Chinese cities with each other, and that's what you will um, get some sense of from this chapter, um, All the Coffee in China. All right. <clears throat> 
In their 1994 bestseller, China Wakes, Nicholas Kristof and Cheryl Wu Dunn described the competing pull of two basic storylines as they reported from Beijing for the New York Times in the wake of 1989's Tiananmen crisis. Sometimes, they write, the most important stories seem to be that of a decaying dynasty struggling to retain its monopoly on power. At other moments, though, the country's booming economy stood out as the more significant story to track. Who better symbolized the newest new China, the husband and wife team of Pulitzer Prize winning reporters mused in their book about uh, China Wakes? The prisoner and the Lao guy, the Chinese gulag, or the poor farmer turned millionaire? As the century turned and high, both high growth rates and repressive political policies continued, these two storylines continued to seem compelling to many commentators on China. Increasingly, though, three additional Chinese tales began to compete for headline space. One was the resurgence of nationalism storyline, symbolized by the anti-American demonstrations of 1999, which I was present to witness, and I devote an entire chapter to them in the book as well as the nastier anti-Japanese street actions of early 2005, which I simply read about, and also excitement over the Beijing Olympics. All of this fits in with the um, nationalism storyline. This is a picture I like, which was a, a Shanghai advertisement for the Beijing uh, Olympics, which I think looks like a runaway float from It's a Small World. A second increasingly important new storyline for a new century was the spread of consumerism in step with global trends, symbolized by the arrival of satellite dishes and the new sorts of sites of consumption that I focus on in several chapters, and the arrival of the automobile as a consumer good. A third increasingly important new storyline told of new kinds of protests, symbolized by such things as the early 2002 demonstrations by laid off workers in northeast China who felt they were leave, being left behind in the drive to privatize the economy, and the late 2005 protests in a South China village during which paramilitary police fired on residents who were protesting government plans to build a power plant on their land. So I've laid out five storylines that I think competed for attention in the American media around the dawn of the new century. And each of them, I think, when handled well, shed some light on the PRC today. And yet something has struck me, especially thinking about cities and thinking about my recent trips to Chinese cities that I had visited in the 80s and returned to in the 90s and early in the 21st century, that's being left out of all of those. This is the renewed importance of local pride and local identity in the lives of urban Chinese. Ironically, attachment to particular cities has probably never been stronger than it is in the current era of revived nationalism and rampant globalization, two things that I think we're accustomed to thinking pulling away from intense identification with a city. There's an idea that in an earlier period of history, civic identities might have been primary, but then the nation competed with them, and then even later, global um, calls on loyalty came into play. I first became interested in this general phenomenon when I returned to the PRC in 1996 after an eight-year absence. I was struck by two contrasts between the billboards and signs I saw in the streets then and those that I remembered from the 1980s when I lived in China for a year. The most obvious change was that much more public space was given over to logos and phrases associated with imported products and activities and images of those products. Everywhere you turned, it seemed, there were ads for KFC or karaoke cognac or Coca-Cola. But there was a second shift unrelated to commerce. In the late 1980s, the streets were still filled, as they had been for decades, with placards and posters extolling the virtues of the Communist Party and its national policies. You could say that the Chinese Communist Party was still the main advertiser. The streets were filled with advertisements for what it was doing. Some of these were still around in 1996 and still are around today. But now they have to vie for attention with displays that sing the praises of specific cities as well as specific products. <laughs> for every billboard calling on all Chinese to strive to make China a great nation, it seemed, in the 90s, there were two that exhorted the citizens of Beijing or Shanghai or Chongqing to make their metropolis a first-class metropolis. On subsequent visits, this has continued, except now increasingly it's video screens as well as still billboards that are used to celebrate the city as well as, and sometimes in competition with other cities, or as well as the nation. 
And I've continued to notice the shift in the use of public space to promote locales and also been struck by a complementary development in the world of publishing. The shelves of Shanghai bookstores in particular, but not exclusively, are now filled with works of local history, including collections of photographs that detail the fashions and lifestyles of Shanghai's Treaty Port period, 1843 through 1943, during which the city was divided into foreign-run and Chinese-run districts. Now, this turn to local history in itself is not a complete departure from the 1980s. Local history was already a thriving cottage industry in Shanghai and elsewhere then. But in works published before the 1990s, the stories of particular urban centers tended to be folded neatly into larger national narratives. And the only significance of Shanghai's Treaty Port era and that that several other cities experienced, was seen as lying in the way the experience of foreign-run enclaves attested to China's humiliating semi-colonial status, quote-unquote, prior to 1949. Now, by contrast, many works approach the local past as intrinsically fascinating or important. They no longer reduce it to just one distinctive piece in a grand patriotic puzzle. And in Shanghai, at least, the Treaty Port's legacy is currently presented as a complex mixture of good and bad things something that was humiliating, but also positioned Shanghai well to move forward in global times. On recent trips to China, I've also been struck by how many new books focus on comparing and contrasting individual cities. Especially popular are those that delineate the allegedly night and day differences between Beijing people, stereotyped as stodgy or honest, politically astute or politically obsessed, depending on one's perspective, and Shanghai people, stereotyped as hedonistic or fashionable, money-grubbing, or creatively entrepreneurial. And as somebody who's moved near to L.A., where I grew up, I see a lot of parallels between the Beijing stereotypes and the New York stereotypes and the Shanghai ones and the L.A. ones. Shallow and superficial, cultured or snobby, pick, take your pick. These works revisit, in the Chinese case, an early 20th century debate over the relative merits of Jing Pai capital faction, and high pie coastal faction, attitudes and styles. Interestingly, as I learned during my 1999 visit, which took place over the period when NATO bombs destroyed the Chinese embassy in Belgrade and protests erupted, this renewed competition between locales can even add surprising twists to moments of nationalist fervor. When I arrived in Shanghai on May 10, 1999, after observing rowdy anti-NATO protests in Beijing on May 9th, I remarked to an old Shanghainese friend and to new acquaintances as well that I felt much less hostility towards me as an American in their metropolis than I had in the capital. In Beijing, I'd learned quickly how to say I'm from Australia in Chinese, but I stopped saying that when I got to Shanghai. This was almost always interpreted as an invitation for my Shanghainese friends, old and new, to expound upon the overall superiority of Shanghai. And this is in the midst of a patriotic movement, remember. Beijing people are too dogmatic and jingoistic, many people told me, whereas Shanghai people, though just as patriotic, are more cosmopolitan and more likely to make governments are governments, but people are people. Zhengfu shi Zhengfu, renmin shi renmin, their motto. Yes, your country's policies have infuriated us, several people told me, from taxi drivers to bookstore attendants, but this doesn't mean Shanghainese like us can't remain friends and do business with individual Americans. My subsequent trips to Shanghai have convinced me that just as local pride can give particularistic inflections to expressions of nationalism, it can do the same for transnational fads. The coming of Starbucks, for example, which first opened branches in Beijing in 1999 and Shanghai in 2000. Illustrate this. Westerners often assume that a Starbucks is a Starbucks is a Starbucks, and the menus and decor of the Chinese branches are very like those of their American counterparts. Yet Starbucks branches occupy very different niches, not just in the cultural landscape of the United States as opposed to China, but that of Beijing as opposed to Shanghai. For example, controversy broke out in the capital when a branch opened at the edge of the Forbidden City. And since my book came out, that controversy has re-erupted and the branch has closed. But Shanghai people, on the other hand, took it quite in stride when one opened in Xintiandi, New Heaven and Earth, a new but old-looking entertainment district, even though that outlet in the Shanghai, in, in Xintiandi, is right around the corner from the hallowed site of the Communist Party's founding Congress. In addition, the Beijing and Shanghai stores vie for clients with different sorts of Chinese-owned establishments. In the capital, some of the main competitors are old or newly opened but old-style tea houses of the sort in which, at least in the popular imagination, 
Confucian scholars once gathered to talk about poetry <laughs> and the classics. In Shanghai, on the other hand, there's a different mix. There are some old-style tea houses, to be sure, but these seem less important competitors to Starbucks than other sorts of establishments. Tea houses with walls devoted to displays of experimental art, for example, Japanese-style coffee houses, and above all, cafes designed to evoke memories of the early 1930s, remembered as a time when the metropolis was a fashionable and heavily westernized Paris of the East. And there are some nostalgia thing cafes that you can go into and have and drink, but this one, which I have a shot of, is actually in the basement of the Urban Planning um, Museum in Shanghai, where on upper levels it shows you what Shanghai of the future will look like, but then down below you're reminded of Shanghai in the past. And the theme is, this is a once, once and now again global city, cosmopolitan hub. When strolling Shanghai streets today, tourists and residents are like, alike are invited to enter places with tacky names such as the Real Shanghai Cafe, and inside these venues, as well as establishments that try in subtler and more graceful ways to cash in on the Lao Shanghai, Old Shanghai, nostalgia craze, the walls are often plastered with black and white or sepia-toned photographs of the city in its pre-communist heyday as an international metropolis. One of the nicest of the new cafes to use its interior decor to encourage visitors to think that they have traveled back in time to another cosmopolitan period is actually located inside one of the most important architectural landmarks dating from that period, the one-time headquarters of the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank, of which these lions are the most famous icons out front. And um, the cafe is inside that what was once one of the largest bank headquarters in the world. And from that, you can look up at one of the other landmarks of old Shanghai, um, the giant clock tower, which is the largest clock tower in Asia when it was put up in the late 1920s, called Big Ching, a play on Big Ben to make you think this is a bit of London transposed to the east. In Shanghai, though not Beijing in other words, the arrival of Starbucks in 2000 seems simultaneously a novelty and a resumption of an old cosmopolitan trajectory that was interrupted for a time. Now, is all this discussion of cafes just a case of a coffee lover making too much of the fact that there are now scores of places he can get a good cup of cappuccino in a city that served little but instant when he lived there in the mid-1980s? Maybe. But recent visits to the Shanghai History Museum, which is made up of carefully designed displays of well-crafted wax figures and dioramas, suggest otherwise to me. One of its exhibits, shown here in a postcard, portrays a cafe scene circa 1930. At one table, the one shown here, we see several young Shanghainese men, all dressed in Western suits, drinking coffee and carrying on a spirited conversation, perhaps of the relative strengths and weaknesses of Jing Pai and Hai Pai novelists. Nearby is another table where a Chinese man and a man from India are conversing, a nod perhaps to the poet philosopher Tagore's famous visit to Shanghai 80 some years ago. The decision to include scenes like this and others without clear political meaning in a museum devoted to the local past is one that would not have been made in the 1980s, since they have no direct links to issues of national import, such as the anti-imperialist struggles of the 1910s through 1940s, in which Shanghai people of various social classes played leading roles. As an astute Western colleague pointed out after a visit to this museum, however, there is something still more remarkable about it when, than what its tableaus contains. This is something that is missing from the written materials in the museum that recount Shanghai's pre-1949 history in this era of local identification. There is no mention anywhere of the Communist Party. This lack may tell us as much as any presence about the resurgence of localism in born-again global Shanghai. One of the main driving forces <coughs> behind the resurgence of local identity is, after all, a desire to find new bases for loyalty and affection to fill the void left by the cynicism that many Chinese now feel toward a system that seems irredeemably corrupt and a regime whose ideology seems less and less coherent and compelling with each passing year. Thank you. I'd like to uh, thank the Wilson Center and thank Jeff for inviting me to participate in a discussion of this very stimulating book. Uh, for an academic, Jeff has written in a very informal style, and uh, I 
decided that gave me license to respond in a very informal style, which is to say I read the book a little while ago, but only sat down this morning to go over it and <laughs> jot down a few things that uh, stood out to me, things that I took away from it. A and uh, so first I'd like to talk about what uh, Jeff has given us and particularly what he's given those of us in academics. Uh, there's a great deal that uh, perhaps a uh, majority of the people in this audience, being a Washington uh, Wilson Center audience, uh, will want to talk about with regard to uh, the political scene in China today, and certainly Jeff should uh, bring his wealth of expertise on uh, that uh, to our discussion later on. But this is also a book about contemporary urbanism worldwide, and that's where it connects with interests of mine. Uh, a lot of what I throw out here in response is really just going to be some open-ended questions, which I felt were uh, floating in, in the air, if not stated explicitly in the course of the book, and they're questions that um, concern, p perturb me uh, in my own work on the city of Tokyo and in thinking about cities generally. Uh, so first I'd like to speak, uh, address a couple of those questions. Uh, then I, I thought I would uh, bring up two themes that were salient to me of a global nature. One is what Jeff calls theme parking, the uh, tendency of urban space to look more and more like theme parks, a and the other is the issue of memory. And finally, uh, particularly in relation to that latter theme, I have a few slides from Tokyo I'll show you afterwards. Uh, so the first thing that Jeff seems, seems to have given us I I is this wonderful question. What kind of uh, urban culture is it that's taking shape around us uh, right now in cities like Shanghai, but also uh, Jeff takes us to Sydney and to Chicago and to Budapest, and also uh, in places that we less are less likely to think of as sites of urban culture, like Tippecanoe County, Indiana, which nevertheless clearly participate in some a kind of global common urban experience that he uh, a sketches for us in illuminating ways. And related to this is a question, uh, particularly for those of us in academe who study urban culture, um, and uh, I first find myself putting it in the kind of abstract language of, of, of an academic, but I'll explain myself. What is the distance between ourselves and our objects of inquiry? Uh, and to be more concrete, what I mean is when you talk, for example, about consumer culture or the consumer society, something many of us find ourselves doing in analyzing contemporary cities, um, invariably you're gesturing towards a kind of mass psychology but you're not usually not actually doing those focus groups and opinion surveys to find out what the masses are thinking. So the question that I think Jeff's style, the stance he's taken in this book, throws to us is when you speak that way, uh, does your theory apply to yourself? That's why I say what's the distance between us and the object of our study? It's very easy to talk about uh, this is not a radical critique anymore. It's not, does it, it's not limited to academe, academe to talk about how the American cities are mollifying or cities of the world are becoming like theme parks uh, in rather dire tones and cite a lot of French philosophers in the process and it sounds weighty. Um, but often in, the pr in that process, you're establishing yourself on the outside of all that experience. One of the wonderful things about what Jeff's done is uh, in addition to admitting that he's an early life Disney fan, um, <laughs> is he's traveled to places and sort of tested on himself what is it we pick up from cities rather than what is it the masses are uh, being duped into accepting. Uh, and this relates, he actually gives us a bunch of techniques. If you're traveling and you show up in a new city, this was one of my favorite uh, sort of, uh, is it the chapter, Why Go Anywhere, I think favorite little intellectual ex exercises in this book. He says, if you're traveling somewhere, uh, there are a bunch of things you can do to explore what's different about that place, even in this context of the global cultural homogenization we all hear so much about. Uh, what he calls little uh, sort of in traveler's games. For example, finding things that are apparently the same, like the McDonald's, and noting what's different about it. And the little, the, the, the details of these places that distinguish the localness of them. Or looking for examples of passé high tech, things that appeared to be the cutting edge maybe just 20 years ago, and then asking yourself, what here now 
is still going to be around 10 years from now and what will have turned out not to be the next big thing. A uh, very interesting set of little related games. One very serious game that I think he just tosses out there and might pursue further is he suggests counting cameras versus video screens in an urban space as a measure of how Orwellian or how like Huxley's Brave New World the city you're in is. And it's a very interesting exercise to imagine yourself doing. Um, that is obviously a society of surveillance uh, of a kind of technologically enabled authoritarianism as one model. And he talks about this with regard to predictions about China over the past uh, two decades uh, versus a society of kind of politically evacuated uh, consumer paradise, the sort of thing that Huxley sketched in Brave New World. Uh, of these two categories, Tokyo is off the map over on the Huxley side of things, um, as I think some of you already know, and I'll show you an image or two of that. Um, in any case, I think that could be a very serious game we might play and a very interesting one to think about. And, and that relates to this theme parking issue or what people also, also call disnification of urban space. I was in, uh, I participated in a year-long seminar on cities a couple of years ago at Princeton, and that was the one thing we found everybody kept coming back to. One person was showing <coughs> us uh, a, you know, a, a remarkably <coughs> lifelike replica of a Tuscan town in the outskirts of Johannesburg. <laughs> um, and then, of course, another person was bringing us to Xintiandi in uh, Shanghai, and uh, th there were a dozen other examples. Everybody was noting this sort of uh, creation of uh, extremely lifelike ersatz environments all over the world. And this is a global homogen homogenization of a kind because, in fact, there's a, you know, there's a template. It started in Las Vegas, probably. Disney has perfected it. Uh, Hollywood has perfected it. And there are companies that bring the, the sort of strategies and the uh, hardware of this all over the world now. Um, uh, something that uh, Japanese sociologist Yoshimi Shunya, who's a brilliant writer on this subject, by the way, uh, pointed out years ago, is that the Disneyfication thing, it's not just about fakery and fantasy. It's about creating completely hermetic environments in which you uh, don't see it outside and you don't uh, have to reflect on yourself in this kind of fantasy experience you're having. Uh, but as I said, this is already very familiar territory, and Jeff rightly points us to the possibilities in his discussion, discussion of Chicago, points us to the possibilities that we're already kind of moving beyond that stage, even as it burgeons in the physical environment around us. And clearly that's happening in part with the Internet, a fantasy environment that no longer requires that we step outside the door to, uh, to uh, you know, imagine ourselves in uh, another world. And he speaks of uh, a move from the era of the couch potato consumer, uh, which is to say the passive consumer who simply has this environment of uh, uh, this, this uh, city of uh, delights pitched at uh, her or him to what he calls the karaoke singer, karaoke singer uh, consumer, who is now participant virtually in creating uh, their own uh, fantasy environment, something that is happening in lots of forms on the web as well. Uh, and this parallels another Japanese sociologist who works doing very interesting stuff, a guy named Morikawa, uh, who has written about the electronics town, Akihabara, in Tokyo. Maybe some of you have been to Tokyo, you went there and uh, ogled it or even came away with a Walkman some years ago. This place has transformed in the 1990s in very interesting ways into animation town. And it's a, it's a phenomenal virtual environment, but it is built around a strange kind of subculture that participates in the construction of that environment. They're not passive consumers. They actually go there in a kind of micro-capitalist mode, buying, selling, and trading uh, little plastic model kits and modified versions of software and all kinds of stuff. So it is not the old Disney model where consumers simply immerse themselves in something prepared for them. Uh, so an interesting, Jeff calls it the fourth stage uh, after earlier stages in this spectacular <coughs> development of cities uh, can be seen in this Akihabara. Okay, finally, this theme of uh, memory. This is something that uh, I've given a great deal of thought to in the context of Tokyo. Uh, the, the question that seems to hang over 
uh, this entire project in that sense is why has this become so important of the things that could be happening changing in urban culture and Jeff has alluded to the important uh, resurgence of local identities. Uh, certainly in the Chinese context, there's a political response, a regime and its ideology from which people are becoming estranged. People turn back to some fantasy earlier time, like Shanghai in the 30s perhaps, but it's so pervasive, it's so global. Uh, why is it that what uh, Andreas Huysen calls our uh, vast museal culture, museum culture, um, has uh, suddenly emerged since uh, the 80s all over the world? And the first, the natural response, I think, that comes to mind is, well, a certain level of wealth and leisure and people uh, start to appreciate uh, the uh, physical stock of the old city, the better things of their culture. They're, they have the, the, the uh, sort of a freedom to do so. And I would say that's enabling, but it's not a sufficient uh, or determining condition. Uh, and it doesn't address the, the different forms in which the past is being, being brought back in in so many places. Uh, the other response that's very common is part of this postmodern critique. Uh, there's been this collapse of master narratives uh, of a belief in progress, and people naturally turn nostalgic. It becomes a kind of historical fantasy to replace uh, idealism about the future. Um, and this takes us a certain distance, I suppose. But finally, it seems to me that Jeff's book suggests that there's something not explained by either of these uh, uh, partial answers, that people are desiring some kind of different narrative of the city besides the one provided by the state, and desiring something, uh, a narrative different from the narrative of progress. And uh, in this sense, uh, the mass consumer is very much like the cultural critic in academe, uh, where looking to uh, other ways to tell the story of our environment uh, beyond those uh, sort of set up by a developmentalist uh, paradigm of uh, the state. Uh, and at one extreme, this is, for example, uh, going to live in Celebration USA, where you accept a static model of tradition created for you by the Disney Corporation, a completely fabricated tradition. Uh, then, perhaps more pervasive, we see places like Xin Tian Di in Shanghai, bits of local past being repackaged. And then finally, and I think for us most intriguing, uh, is something that Jeff dwells on in a number of places here, and that is uh, an appreciation of the palimpsestic nature of the city. That is, the way uh, the city is always a place of historical layers. And not layers of important past monuments, but layers at the most, e even microscopic, but in any case, the most everyday sort of level, uh, all of the time. And this is something that people in po Tokyo started to pick up on in the 80s. And it was a very interesting time for that, because it was, of course, also the period of the most uh, uh, overinflated real estate prices, and therefore the pressures towards development and uh, destruction of the survival, surviving layers of the past uh, were greatest. Let me just show you a couple of slides then. This chair here. Oh, so I need to unplug you and plug the. No, it's your oh, plug there. Oh, it's just okay, open great. up your. Yes, great. Um, okay, so uh, I just have a few images from uh, Tokyo in the 90s and aughts, for the most part. Uh, and to start with, this was, at the time it was built, the tallest structure in Asia. So, and it's a, of course, it's an administrative building for the Tokyo uh, government. So it gives us a sense of what sort of sense of uh, self-importance and grandiosity Tokyo had uh, at the end of the years of the economic bubble. And of course, also, uh, this is the product of uh, real estate taxes that uh, uh, enriched a uh, municipal government. The sort of hub of the new urban culture at that time in the 80s, and it continues to flourish today, was Shibuya Station. You can see a little bit of the brave new world with just the, the amount of imagery with which one is bombarded in a space like this. And uh, my friend Morikawa, I was mentioning a couple of minutes ago, has talked about this as the sort of prototypical uh, disney space of this period of uh, urban culture, 
we see it again uh, at night, but supplanted in the 90s by the uh, new urban culture of these people called otaku. Uh, some of you have probably heard the word that is uh, animation and uh, plastic model and comic book hobbyists who have this burgeoning and now global subculture uh, whose epicenter is in Akihabara, the old electronics uh, district. It used to be called Akihabara. I still call it Akihabara, but everybody under 20-something calls it Akiba now. They just, I guess it's part of the argot of the place. In any event, um, Morikawa notes that the first large-scale high-rise development in Tokyo took place with this heavy uh, corporate capitalist and government presence in Shinjuku <laughs> in the 70s. And that's what we see, the first uh, collection of high-rises built then, a, a kind of anonymous gray uh, business district. The second is this commercial efflorescence in the 80s, which everybody associated with the kind of Disneyfication of the city in Japan, and it's by large commercial interests, the Cebu department store and so forth. And the third is since 1997, according to my friend Morikawa, uh, and the model for this urban development is actually the web itself. And it's much more fragmentary, and the entire place is made up of um, constantly changing imagery, and there is really no large capital presence. Now this, this I, I, I would like to see more analysis of actually who owns the uh, land and who pays the rents for it and so forth, but at least at the level of what is being marketed and who's out there buying and selling, it's a very different environment. It has been sort of <laughs> privatized down to, uh, instead of being a sort of public theatrical uh, spectacle, it's a lot of intensely private hobbyist consumers going to trade things uh, through little sort of coin lockers. And here are some of them. And he notes the difference between the buildings of the uh, commercial capital era, which are all open and projecting outwards, and the buildings of the more recent era in Akihabara, which are just anonymous boxes, like giant kind of lockers in which you go and trade. And the uh, advertising on the buildings themselves very much like a uh, computer menu. Okay, on the subject of memory, I'll just close with a few here. Um, I was, as I was reading uh, Jeff on Chicago and uh, thinking about this sort of post disnification -Disney moment, I found myself thinking, I have to explain why I love the Shin Yokohama Ramen Museum so much. Um, the name is good, that's to start with. This is, this is the first stop on the bullet train heading west from Tokyo. And uh, there is this museum with one of these reconstructed uh, nostalgic landscapes inside. You go down stairs to this, through this intentionally rusticated uh, stairwell into this uh, lifelike little uh, streetscape from the 1950s. This is supposed to be a Japanese city in the 1950s, and of course there's a little festival going on, very Disney pattern. But the streetscape is humble to the extreme, and a perfect <coughs> recreation of what back alleys in Tokyo would have looked like. I lived there in the 50s, that's exactly It looked like this. Well, you, if, you, if you want to go back, <laughs> it awaits you inside this building near Shin Yokohama Station. And what you do is you buy little uh, confections of the sort you would have bought on the street in Tokyo in the 1950s, and you go and you eat ramen. And here's where I liked it so much. This is where the Disney mold has been broken in the 90s, because just when you think you're in this completely enclosed environment where you're supposed to fantasize, they, they remind you it's just a game. All of the people who work at the ramen shop are not dressed up in period costume. Most of them are actually too young to have been alive at the time. And the, the shops are labeled beauty salon or movie theater or whatever, and inside it's just an ordinary ramen shop. And I found that the young people there, a few of them are in costume, they'll actually step outside of their role to talk to you about, aren't the 50s, you know, weren't they a wonderful time, and so on. <laughs> so there's this extreme sort of self-consciousness to the whole thing. It's being ironized. And it seems to me that this is the only sort of post-Disney response that was still possible. Now I just close with a couple of slides of another sort of memory that uh, emerged in the late 80s in Japan, and this is the palimpsestic, the very sort of microscopic look uh, at the layers of history in the city. A group who called themselves the Street Observation Science Society, 
um, went about collecting things that were no longer useful or had never been useful but had been lovingly preserved. And, so they're, and then they label them and, and, and classify them uh, like this, the perfect staircase of Yotsuya. You see it goes up and it just comes down. <coughs> Um, or little projecting, projecting roofs that serve no function, or boxed up <coughs> windows on the sides of buildings. And they give them elaborate sort of Linnaean classifications. These are, these are Mount Fujis in Tokyo. There are all kinds of Mount Fujis. If you start looking for Mount Fuji in Tokyo, they're everywhere, in signs, shapes of buildings, uh, little cartoon characters, and so forth. I think that's all I've got. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> Wiffen. Um, I'm very, very pleased to be back here at the Wilson Center. I lost my voice in California, so I hope I can go through the 20 minutes without com going completely um, dark. Um, some of the work I've been talking about today actually was really inspired by the project Blair and Allison were organizing um, more than 10 years ago. So um, you see what a difference you have made. And I really also wanted to uh, applaud Jeff for really uh, uh, venture into this uh, path of public intellectual. We were talking about how the term would translate into Chinese and how funny it would actually be because intellectuals are supposed to be public in China, right? Um, uh, and something that I'm only learning myself through a program uh, called the Public Intellectual Program uh, organized by the National Committee on U.S. and China Relations. And Jeff really has done a wonderful job many of us are learning uh, to do. I um, thought I would um, perhaps um, respond to some of the very provocative questions that Jeff has raised in his book. Uh, and some of these questions also then relate to some of the work that I have been doing on Chinese cities and uh, on issues related to uh, urbanization. And Jeff, in his um, book, very, very um, uh, sort of pointly calls for a more nuanced understanding of what's happening in China. And he uh, really characterized um, much of the um, media coverage on China in the U.S. In, into sort of two streams. One is uh, uh, demonization and the, versus the Americanization. And I think Jeff has done a great uh, uh, job in his book in um, presenting the intricacies and complexities that are evolving in the Chinese cities. But he's really looking at Chinese city from uh, uh, several different scales, from both the urban space to individuals and to some institutions. And uh, he, in his book, presented, for instance, how McDonald's and uh, Starbucks really mean different things for Chinese people. And for bowling alleys, it's really more of a girl thing. And uh, McDonald really more is uh, a place for kind of uh, fancy white collar workers uh, taking their kids going on the weekends. And Starbucks uh, <coughs> is also in many ways not uh, a typical American Starbucks in Chinese cities. What I'm trying to perhaps um, do here is ask Jeff more questions in, in your further pursuit is, as a social scientist, then I'm interested in then what makes McDonald's and Starbucks uh, carry very different meanings in China? And could it be just the working of economics? I mean, that's a simplified question. I'm sort of also a closet economist. Um, we know that many of the global brands that get to China are only uh, consumed and experienced um, by a very small or limited segment of the population. Uh, so if you go to McDonald's or Starbucks, or they're a little bit different in the U.S. You know, McDonald's is fast food, everybody goes. Starbucks is a little bit different. But in China, both of them really are quite expensive. Only uh, upper middle income, uh, white color, um, professionals can really afford that. As a result, that you see uh, 
the kind of cleanliness, the fanciness of some of these establishments uh, in Chinese cities. In fact, Pizza Hut, for instance, uh, which isn't in your book, but is very similar, that has huge lines um, outside of um, one of the department stores in Shanghai every single night because people want to get into it to eat pizza. So, um, but who are these people? If we talk to them, they're most likely um, white color or pink color uh, professionals. So, in that sense, um, when we look at urban life in China's brave new world, there are a huge uh, sort of unseen scenes that I would like to show you some of them, that the ordinary people, particularly one big segment of them who are migrants, are really not integrated into this globalized China or globalized urban scene. And, um, and that very much uh, leaves us to sort of uh, in, 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 in the need, at least for some of us uh, who do a lot of work on China, to see um, how some of the contradictions perhaps are the inevitable transformation China is, uh, the inevitable results of the transformation China is going through from a sort of socialist uh, society to a market-driven society. Uh, and, and, and that relates to my second point that Jeff is uh, bringing up in his book and saying history really is not repeating itself. Um, and he looks at Shanghai in terms of, you know, pre-1949, Shanghai was this Paris of the East, and today it's trying to renew of that uh, fame, but in a very different way. But I'm also saying here then, um, if, if, you know, in time history is not repeating itself, could we look at it in space? Is China's transformation today producing some of the, the problems and uh, processes that we're seeing in cities elsewhere? <coughs> um, and I think Jordan has mentioned some of that already. I'm looking at more, perhaps more of the darker sides of it, uh, perhaps uh, uh, related to inequality, stratification, and marginality. And uh, are these um, unnecessary or necessary consequences of China's transformation? And then, um, so in some ways, Jeff mentioned this nostalgia, you know, Mao's beeping rain, could be sort of in a way of a joking and laughing uh, matter, but in some ways for those of us who live the uh, socialist period, who live through the socialist period, there's a true sense of nostalgia, the loss of some of the socialist values uh, after the rise of some of this intrinsic problem. I don't know if they are intrinsic problems of a market-driven society, but they seem to be because we, are seen, we have seen them uh, uh, everywhere. And thirdly, I want also to mention something that Jordan has responded a little bit as well, that um, what Jeff has called the rising uh, or renewed pride in local identity and um, how that has played out in China, perhaps, you know, as a result of the dissolution of the general populace with the, you know, uh, uh, corruption and uh, fading ideology of the government. I would like to perhaps suppose it in a slightly different light. And I see my good friend Andrew in there that when we were working on um, globalization and localization as a key theme for the 2000 World Development Report, we've always looked at you know, localization as a parallel process. Um, at the same time, globalization is happening. But I think in terms of in China, the localization is very um, again, full of contradictions. You could say that, that, that there is um, strong um, dissatisfaction and dissolution on the populist side, but you can also say it is very much still driven by the centralistic politics um, that is still in place in China today. You know, how would someone who wants to be a rising political star in China behave? He has, he or she has to be accountable to he or to his or her bosses at the next level higher up. So why are localities so interested in promoting large-scale projects? 
in redevelopment, you could say commercial interests, absolutely, but in many ways that they have to rack up a very good performance record in the four years they are uh, in office so that they can move up. For those of you who have followed the Chinese politics in October, the new Congress has uh, you know, presented two possible uh, successors to uh, President Hu. One of them was the mayor of Shanghai, though for not very long, um, but he did very well in Zhejiang. And the other was uh, governor of Henan province, where the AIDS and blood uh, donation scandal was very much centered. And so they have all the incentives to uh, sort of promote such local identity. You see Shanghai is doing better than Beijing, and Beijing is doing uh, better than Chongqing. And now you know all of the major next generation of national leaders are put in offices in these strategic cities to show that they have the capacity to lead these places as a sort of indication of how they will do at the national level. So I think um, that in many ways is very different from some of the dynamics of localism and localization somewhere else. Also, you can kind of say, it's, well, it's not so different from American local politics in many ways. The growth coalition and the growth regimes in many localities, which render it necessary for local politicians to show their success in their time in office. So, um, so I kind of wanted to pose some of these questions to Jeff, and I would love to see uh, his continuous work in uh, the sort of pushing uh, the understanding of China into the public uh, uh, realm. What I wanted to show you some more is uh, partially my own work um, on how this large um, segment of urban population that is now being marginalized in China, and uh, I wouldn't say all of them, but many of them, and many of the local governments I wouldn't say the truth, but in many ways they have no choice but ignoring because most of the problem of migration is national, but the solutions uh, have to come from local, and so far the decentralized state have, oh, something is here. Um, and the centralized government still are, is not willing to um, open up the policy or loosen up the policy <laughs> or allow localities to um, use different types of sort of um, leverage to accommodate um, this large um, segment of the new urban population. And, uh, just really quickly that China isn't just going through globalization, but it's also going through several other major transformations, and two of which really very much relate to the agricultural to manufacturing transformation and the rural-based to urban-based society. These two transformations really bring up this unprecedented tide of migrants in China, and numbers anywhere in between 120 to 150 million uh, uh, Today, about 80% of those people uh, come from the rural areas to urban areas. And um, to just give you an example, Shanghai, as a city of 16 million of <coughs> local population, there are about um, four to five million migrants. The reason I say four to five is that even the local officials aren't quite clear how much they have, how many they have, because of the um, existing 
institutional framework still in many ways excludes migrants, even though they have lived in cities for many years, and so in many ways the local officials have no way of knowing that. But in general, we know that both Beijing and Shanghai uh, have roughly one-fourth of its population as migrants, but we really don't see them in a lot of their official uh, uh, enumerations, except 2,000 census start to account uh, them. These people, because of the, I'm not sure I know how to, actually, okay, good, um, are very typical migrants as we have seen. That's why I said Blair's project really <coughs> has inspired my work here. In 1996, I took a trip to Brazil. I saw all of the favela, and I was looking at Chinese cities. I say I had a, a, ch a Brazilian scholar telling me that this is like deja vu, that this will happen in China as well, the kind of, uh, informal settlements, the kind of marginality, the new urban pool would arise as a result of migration. So I start paying attention to migrants in 1997. And in China today, of course, we're not seeing the kind of social problems that the Latin American cities have seen. We are not seeing the massive um, squatter settlements that many Latin American cities have seen. We're also not seeing the kind of poverty uh, that um, many Latin American cities have seen. However, this is not to say that the future is very safe. On the part of the um, spatial or settlement parts that the government still impose tremendous amount of control over land and land evasion, and that's why we're not seeing uh, squatter settlements, but we are seeing poverty. And I have colleagues who have done research on uh, urban poor or rising urban poverty in China that much of it could really be uh, migrants. Although then again, in official statistics, you're not seeing that. So what, what I mentioned as to the institutional structure are these divides that are, institu uh, that are institutionalized through the household registration system. Yes, in some smaller cities, the system is not as pervasive, but in large cities, the system is intact and is affecting migrants in a very unfavorable way. So I sort of, in a sense, call it the rural-urban divide as well as the local to non-local divide. I don't want to show this is a little um, too much sort of, uh, oops. Oops. I'm not too good with the visual aids. Okay. Because of the limited access to housing, education, and jobs, what you're seeing is um, in the cities, migrants, or I would say oh, more than 95% of the 4 million migrants in Shanghai, 3 million migrants in Beijing, or 2 million in uh, Nanjing, are living in situations like this. And you will say this is no different from Latin American cities, squatter settlements. Yes, they are not. Uh, no, they are not very different. However, we don't call them squatter settlements because these actually are built legally. Um, so the sort of migrant housing is temporary, migrant housing is overcrowded, migrant housing lacks facilities, um, uh, and um, for the 2,500 migrants I have studied in Beijing and uh, Shanghai, only about 1% of migrants actually have been able to buy housing uh, in the cities. Do you know how many, what's the housing ownership rate in Chinese cities in general? 80%. So that essentially applies to the local residents. And what I also want to kind of give you an image of these migrants is their migration journey does not stop once they get to the cities. They are drifting in the city. As you will see, the horizontal line is the number of years they've stayed and the vertical lines are how many times they've moved. If it's 120%, that means they have moved on average 1.2 times per year. And uh, Beijing and Guangzhou, the pictures are very similar, except the rates are somewhat different. But you can see, even though after five or six years, they keep moving at least once every two years. And then, of course, as they stay in the cities a little longer, they move a little less. In both cities, the local residents only move what we call four out of 100 people moves once a year in local. This is more than 100% in Beijing in the first year of the people move 
80% the next year, 60% the third year, and you see it's very, very different kinds of mobility patterns. It's completely un incomparable. The, so they drift, they also get stuck. I call it they get stuck in, um, in the cities in two senses. One is they never make the transition from renters to owners. And we know even in Latin American cities, they make this transition from what we call bridge headers to consolidators or um, renters to owners um, or even through in self-help housing. But in the Chinese cities, they get stuck in private rental. They also get stuck particularly in the large cities, in a very small segment of the city. I've also looked at the mobility patterns spatially of these migrants. They don't move very far. They move very often, but they don't move very far. So the large size of the cities render it you know, possible only for them to get to know only one part of the city really well. And uh, so if residential mobility is any indication of their social economic mobility, which really is, and that's why a lot of scholars study residential mobility, then you could basically say these migrants are stuck in the dead-end jobs at the lower bottom of the uh, uh, society and um, uh, are not going anywhere. So that's why I call them getting stuck. And to get to overcome these housing barriers, if you're interested in knowing some of these barriers, um, uh, I'd be happy to answer later. Uh, essentially, they rely on a very sort of informal system of friends and relative co-villagers throughout their stay in the cities. And this is no different, again, from Latin American cities and other cities around the world. So in many ways, if we travel in space but not in time, China's patterns could be very much replicating what is, has happened uh, elsewhere. Um, and they are also begin to have some impact on the urban form of the city. I don't have really good pictures on this, but if you can see, this is again, uh, Jeff is writing his book on uh, globalizing Shanghai. This is Shanghai in terms of its geography. Um, but what we're seeing today is that most of the local population still lives pretty close to the center, so the dark spots, right? This is 2000 census, it's very recent. Um, but if you look at migrants, they live on the outskirts, not the most outside suburb, but what we call the inner suburb, right outside the central city. And if you look at the share of migrants in total population, you can see that per peri-urban reign uh, uh, very clearly in Shanghai. In Beijing, it's a little bit different because the urban form is different. Now, if you look at this, then you think about La Paz, Mexico City, and uh, lots of other cities around. Uh, the patterns are very, very similar. That migrants, because of a rising cost of housing in central city and other kinds of factors, they have to be seeking uh, cheaper housing elsewhere. And but they have to be close to jobs, and they have to be uh, um, because they rely on walking or public transportation. So they ended up in these peri-urban or what we call um, uh, urban peripheral areas. So we are beginning to see the concentration of migrants in certain parts of the city in, 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 in Shanghai. And um, this is interesting because Shanghai is a city, unlike many other Chinese cities. In many ways, Shanghai is not a typical Chinese city. Shanghai is a city that with the history of uh, segregation and residential differentiation, those of us who have studied Shanghai, lived in Shanghai, we know that Shangzhijiao and Xiaojiao upper corner and lower corner, and we're seeing that to be re-emerging again. And this kind of concentration of migrants uh, is likely to contribute to that further uh, uh, segregation and differentiation of urban space uh, in Shanghai. So I want to end this, as you can see, uh, Chinese cities are complex and urban life is very uh, uh, multifaceted and so you see that and guess what I can tell that woman is a migrant because she dresses differently and she um, uh, lives in these older and uh, ready to be redeveloped kinds of areas and this is where in Shanghai you will see lots of gated communities and lots of new kinds of housing complexes uh, uh, both in around downtown as well as in far suburbs uh, on the way to Suzhou, a city about an hour of 
driving away. So this kind of landscape uh, is very much the common scene in Shanghai, I would say. Yes, in the central areas, you will see the glitzy and uh, uh, um, of modern, but as you go a little bit further, go to the periphery areas, going into the uh, uh, suburbs, um, then you see these st stark contrasts and a very awkward just the position of the, uh, um, the, the, the poor or the marginalized and the new and the modern. Um, I guess that's that. Thank you very much. Let me begin by asking Jeffrey if he wants to respond directly to anything that's been said. Uh, just, <coughs> just, just a couple of quick comments. That um, one of the things that I think is a, a trap that that some American China specialists fall into is thinking that they can produce a book that explains China. <laughs> and um, I very much don't think of this as a book that explains China. It's a set of vantage points on parts of the story about China that I thought were um, not getting the kind of attention that they deserved. But so I think of it as, I think of what um, Wei Ping was talking about is, is, is absolutely crucial, that that's a part of the story <laughs> that, it's actually another part of the story that even though we do hear about it, it becomes a continual um, uh, occasional headline about migrants. You really need to see the data and the, the term, you, ne you need to be continually reminded of it in this way to really um, get a sense of it. So I think that's a, a very <laughs> important compliment. What I, what I liked about both of the comments was um, that I think one of the most, imp when I talk about a demonization narrative and an Americanization narrative, one of the things that concerns me about is it seems that the demonization narrative also can, can play into an idea of China as hopelessly exotic. There's the, that it's in a, a completely separate sphere. It's this, this notion of inscrutability rearing its head again. It's that, um, that China is just so strange. Whereas in the Americanization narrative, it's that China was incredibly strange, and now it's becoming just like us so we can deal with it. And I think what's important about um, what we need to do is find a way to talk meaningfully about China's specificities while also realizing that there are many ways in which phenomenon going on in China can be fit into partial comparability with things going on in all sorts of different places. And so I thought both the sets of comments pulled in that very important direction. Um, the only thing I'd say finally is one of the, there, are, there are a couple of things that have happened or that I've become more aware of since the book came out. And one very recent phenomenon is a kind of nostalgia for the 1980s in Shanghai. Um, there are a set of old and new Shanghai books where you see the same, the same place is photographed in black and white on one page, color on the next. And in the 1990s, the black and white was always pre-49, the color was the present. Now there's a very popular book in Shanghai called uh, Changing Shanghai, which is the black and white is the 1980s, and the color, which seems dramatic, like a totally different century, different removed by a century, not just from the, to the 20th to the 21st. Um, it's a father took the shots in black and white, compulsive photographer of documenting the city, and his son has now revisited those places, and they're utterly changed. So it just brings home the magnitude of the change of the urban landscape, the speed and rapidity with which it's been altered. But it also suggests um, this new kind of um, nostalgia. And that has a double meaning for me as consumer, I do try to talk about myself as consumer of poppy culture because it's the, same, it's the Shanghai that I knew in the 1980s and that I feel nostalgic for. What was special about being in China in the mid-1980s, and I feel very lucky to have been there before the consumer revolution took off, was it's the closest that I came to experiencing the positive sides of socialism, of people living in roughly comparable material circumstances with one another, and that's irrevocably lost. In, in Shanghai now. In some ways, for better, it's more fun if you have money to spend in many, many ways for worse because there isn't that sense of a common, um, a shared experience. There's lots that um, I'd love to talk to both of them about further, but I think it would be good to okay. open things up. Well, I was sitting here thinking how I should try to frame the discussion, and um, 
actually, I think Jeffrey just gave me a clue, which is to say it's true that you're not trying to um, explain China and that you're, you sort of have a set of vantage points on urban reality and China, Chinese reality and Chinese urban reality. But I, I want to try not to let you off the hook a little bit and to try to get you to give us some sense of hierarchy of forces. And, I, and, and I, I wanted to try to do this by probing the issue of urban memory and, and maybe uh, both of the discussants can chime in as well and then we can lead into the general discussion. And it seems to me that urban, the, the mobilization and capitalization of the emotions attached to the past is an important story, and it's an important story which we see playing out, as we've heard, in many places around the world. And it's, it's an effort to capitalize on these warm and fuzzy notions of the past, both economically and politically. And what's interesting about it, in part, is that past is often not really so warm and fuzzy to begin with, and the people who have those feelings may actually not have any connection in their own biographies to that past. And we talked about the, um, the ramen vendors in, in, uh, in um, uh, Japan talking about how wonderful the 1950s were when they weren't even born then. My favorite story like that was when I was uh, attending Leningrad State University in the 1970s, having a long, heated conversation with a, a, a Russian student, a Soviet student, who was explaining how important experience, informative experience of the blockade was for him during World War II. When I asked him, well, when were you born? And he said, oh, I was born in 1952. <laughs> and, and that's another way in which this gets played out. So you have emotions attached to a past that people didn't live. So what's going on here? And it seems to me I've heard four or five different explanations and maybe, I, obviously they all fit together, but, but maybe uh, this panel can begin to sort them out. First is sort of post-socialism versus uh, kind of globalization. And I, I was, was it's, it's really interesting how in the Russian context there's an emergence of local history with the collapse of the Soviet Union. And part of the reason for that seems to be the absence of any other ideological hooks that have any meaning at all. And local experience and local monuments was one way of providing meaning in a landscape uh, in, in which all the other markers have, have um, disappeared. But I also wonder if maybe we carry this too far and it, the, when in the late 1980s there were books on old St. Petersburg, and now you're beginning to get restaurants called Old Leningrad. If this isn't basically just you know, people's lives. Um, so how much of this is post-socialist, and or how much of it is really a po what we're talking about in China and Russia, a post-socialist variation on a general theme? Another is why localism? What's really interesting, the examples given here, and, and I could talk about Russia from this point of view, is these are powerfully centralized systems, bureaucratic systems and economic systems. What happens in a context that isn't overly centralized? And I remember, um, uh, just, just off the top of my head, Canadian experience. Well, Canada has been deeply regionalized, and when I went to graduate school in Canada, no, hardly anybody really claimed to be Canadian, and yet now the Canadian identity is showing much more strength than it had 20, 30 years ago. Is this really what you're describing, this localism, a response to hyper-centralization, or is it a response to something else? Why is the city the narrative? that's being pursued. Is it simply we all live in cities? There's an interesting contrast here between Russia and Ukraine because in many ways these, the starting point for both societies was very similar, but the new Ukrainian national narrative is focused on the rural peculiarities of Ukrainian culture even though most by far the majority of Ukrainians never set foot on a working farm. They may have their, you know, their dachas they go out to. Where in Russia it's much, much more urban. Um, then there are the questions of 
the people who are left out, the three billion people in the world who live on two dollars a day or less. Are they excluded from this? Is this simply yet another way in which those who have something exclude those who have not from the meaning of their lives? And finally, the issue of migration, which is the world is, you know, migrants are everywhere to be seen in, in the world. Um, there are huge numbers of people moving about. Suddenly is this kind of local history and local symbols a way of trying to give meaning in a world in which people are living in cyberspace or moving about and otherwise don't have meaning. So I'm sure there are others, but I wanted to try to get your sense of a kind of, of is there a hierarchy in your thinking about any of these variables? How do you see the pictures fit together? And then if, if other people on the panel disagree with what you say, we have a discussion. <laughs> great, great. Um, yeah, I wanted to think about this issue of centralization uh, and centrally mandated local development, which is, which is a big part of it. But there's also a responsive side of the center to things that do or don't work. My own sense, and I'll just tell you, my, my sense about Shanghai's takeoff in the 1990s uh, plays into a lot of these things. Shanghai was held back from um, full development in the late 1970s, early 1980s. It wasn't made one of the places, it wasn't supposed to be a showcase of this kind of reform and opening to the West, for whatever reason, um, in some people's minds still being punished for its associations with, um, with capitalism in the past or with um, semi-colonial status and so forth. But the, the dream of the center initially was to make Shenzhen, which was a newly created thing, become the symbol for this. Um, it, my sense is the, the, the things shift in the early 1990s, in part post Tiananmen, and Deng Xiaoping makes a, um, a concerted decision that um, this was a mistake, that Shanghai should be uh, one of the exemplars of modernity. And it's partly, I think, because Hong Kong is about to come back to becoming part of the PRC. Hong Kong, which was fully colonized, is going to look like far and away the most modern city in the PRC. So better to have a partially colonized a long time ago city become that sort of exemplar of modernity than the until now run by the British one. But the other thing that happens, and this is key to nostalgia as well, the Shanghai, old Shanghai craze really <coughs> starts, according to Leo Li, and I think he's persuasive, with Hong Kong, displaced Shanghainese in Hong Kong, and at a later point also displaced Shanghainese in Taiwan, reinvesting in this locale that has, first of all, they create the old, old Shanghai nostalgia in exile, and it partly allows them to solve their ambivalence toward their new home city of Hong Kong, which is colonial, um, but it also then becomes a reinvestment. And so there's a lot of um, part of the Chinese story that's interesting, I don't think unique, because from what I understand it, um, some of the biggest developments in Budapest, one of the biggest malls, was a Hungarian emigrate to Canada, then reinvesting back there, and even in some ways Central European University being created by Soros, there is the diasporic reinvestment. But in the Chinese case, it's just of enormous significance. And at the high end of migrants to Shanghai at the moment, temporary migrants at the high end are, by estimates, something between 300,000 and half a million Taiwanese who work in Shanghai, some of whom, or many of whom, have some kind of familial historic tie there. So you have all sorts of things that are happening with this rediscovery of a local, um, a local past that you can use in one way or another that's feeding it. So in Shanghai, this localism, the, lo the drive for local pride doesn't, isn't always people who have been living there through their lifetime. So there can be different kinds of nostalgias. And those kinds of Hong Kong and Taiwan people who think of themselves as historic ties to Shanghai aren't going to be the ones who are nostalgic for 1980s Shanghai, which was still the sort of Shanghai that was a pale imitation of what they like to imagine their family being linked to, and that now they can reimagine their family being linked to. And, um, but I think this, there's, so there can be a lot of strategic sides to the developments of these things. There could, there's a lot of strate strategy toward, the center has a strategy of having uh, Shanghai Expo, the World Expo is going to be in Shanghai in 2010, and you're all going to hear a lot about that with the ending of the Olympics. 
do we tell this as a story of Shanghai getting its chance to be in the sun after Beijing gets it with the Olympics? Do we have it that, it's, that both of these are about nationalism or, or what? And in a sense, it's both. Clearly, the, the central government wants more investment and more tourists to come in. At the same time, there is a kind of local pride going, going into it. And I think one thing that's very peculiar about this, it leads to some very strange twists in rethinking um, the past or reimagining the past. And um, when there was a lot of coverage of the Starbucks and the Forbidden City being booted out with this idea of um, uh, this being a shame to have in a national treasure like the Forbidden City, and perhaps that has special meaning for Beijing people. But what wasn't covered so much in the Western press was just how peculiar it was that the Forbidden City has made this transition to be someplace that's seen as something that can be defiled. Whereas under Mao's time, it was the most defiled spot in China in some ways. It's a representation of all that was bad about an earlier period. So I do think there is this very peculiar jumbling together of periods in China, r possible reappropriations of different periods. So I guess my, the, the, the thing I would say about the post-socialism that comes in so powerfully is in formerly socialist s states, you have a, a particularly large number of political narratives in play mm -hmm. with the same locales that gives an instability to or, or a room for play. That they're just, I think as Americans, uh, in many ways the things I'm talking about, the theme parking of cities, the playing up of local pride, all, a lot of these things are going on in American cities and I'm trying to de-exoticize. China in that way, and they're going, they're going on in, in, um, in Tokyo as well. And maybe Tokyo has a similarly rich, though not being socialist, set of possible paths to be reinvoked in different ways. Maybe Berlin, one thing that's making it so exciting, even in West Berlin, is again the fact that in living periods there have been radically different narratives about the city and national narratives. I don't think that the narratives have changed so dramatically in the Western non-socialist cities that we can think of. There's been more of a stability for um, the Parisian story. And I don't think, in China, I've, I've played up the urban side here, but there is a very, the, the books about different city cultures are paralleled pretty much by different pro province cultures and regional ones as well. And I think thinking about the region, the, it's very interesting to think about places where it's region versus city identity. I'll give one of the side chapters in this deals with France and traveling to the places that Twain had traveled in the 19th century when he was writing um, Innocence Abroad and thinking about travel in the 19th century and the present. But I just mentioned in passing um, a trip to Nice and one thing that was noticeable in this trip to Nice was the street signs were in two languages. And there were a lot of Italian tourists. And at first I thought that one of the languages was French and the other was Italian, because it looked that way. But it was actually local regional language. And I think you're absolutely right that hypercentralization can lead to a resurgence of localisms. And I think the European Union would be a great example of that. That the nation maybe isn't any, maybe the nation's too big at this point mm -hmm. to feel meaningful. And then an even bigger thing than the identification is with something smaller than the smaller than the nation to identify with. Any additional comments or well I think people should have an opportunity to speak. Yeah. Okay. We're going to open it up. Um, let me see if there are questions, comments, observations. We're going to go right to the back corner first. Please identify yourself. I'm Brian Beery from Congressional Quarterly. Um, I was just wondering if you could talk about migration in, in Western China. I have a friend who was um, in Pakistan and then crossed over the border into the Chinese, uh, into China, and said that there is very interesting developments at the moment in terms of migration patterns of, of Chinese people who are coming to live there from far away, and that are totally changing the dynamic of that region. And if you could just talk about that and why that's happening. Uh, I don't really have the numbers, but. Um, out of the 150 million migrants that are on the move nowadays in China, uh, about 70 percent um, are actually from western and central regions to the coast. So the majority of migration is eastward. However, you are absolutely right that 
That's why I say I don't have numbers how many actually go from the East Coast to the West Coast. I'm sorry, to the, not the coast, the West region, Western region. Uh, but because, um, let me just ask you, um, <coughs> actually the smallest minority group in China is Tibetan. And so t Tibet, given its large territory, actually has very small population. And that's why even a small scale of migration is going to overwhelm the local population. And so is the tide to go to um, Xinjiang. Uh, but most of the migrants we are observing uh, that go to the western regions perhaps can follow into two categories. One is the uh, traders and commercial uh, small entrepreneurs, particularly from Zhejiang province, particularly from Wenzhou. They occupy, they organize a very large network of uh, textile garments sale uh, throughout the country. And uh, so you will see a lot of them in this western region. And second types of migrants most likely going to those western regions and also even onto Russia, parts of Siberia, are farmers who are, you know, because of uh, arable lands very limited in China, they can't really make a living where they are. So um, they, um, uh, so from very poor farming communities out in the central areas could be going to western areas or even to Russia to seek opportunities in farming. So I would say those two types, the first type is the biggest group, the traders and the commercial vendors, entrepreneurs. Um, they are somewhat different because if you look at eastward migration, a lot of them work in factories, uh, in foreign-owned factories, particularly on the east coast near Guangdong, near Shanghai, uh, and then a lot of them work on construction sites, and then another third group are uh, individual entrepreneurs, but different, slightly different kinds of migrants. Why don't we go over here first, and then we'll come up here, and then go back. Um. Hi, my name is Christine. I'm from University of North Carolina. Um, thank you all. I had a question to speak about the idea of memory. Um, when I think about what's happening over there, I spent quite a bit of time. I think about the question of identity and self-identity. And when we're thinking about um, localized identity, I think of a couple other phenomena taking place, which is first of all migration, um, and second of all kind of a somewhat of a breakdown of the family structure, where people are looking for something to identify with themselves. They don't have the sort of communist ideology, they don't have their sort of roots or their origins, and also they don't have their sort of large extended family to comprise their self-identity. And I think I wonder if not instead of not nostalgia, but maybe some of these other phenomenons are helping to make people reach out for a new identity. And that is what is taking place to help create this sort of, um, sort of identification with their locality. So. I, I think, that's, I think that's, that's a good, a good point. I mean, I think a lot of this is um, a searching. And I think, I think the other thing that's um, a factor that I think we just need to know a lot more about is generational generational sense, because I think there are very distinctive notions of what it means that we, that we, I'd like to see more research on, what it means to be a very young Chinese who is, for whom, for whom China has always been in some ways post-socialist, for whom many of the things that, that maybe as scholars we focus on just aren't, aren't exactly relevant. Then, and there I think one of the other things is um, along with a local identity there's also some of a larger than the nation identity. Some via popular culture, for example there's a Korean internet novelist who's enormously popular in China um, with a younger cohort, pretty much unknown in the West. Um, but so there is an, a, the, the spread of um, some forms of South Korean popular culture in general various kind of tastes and things. And I think that one of the things that is in the future, I think, to watch is just this real fragmentation between generations because of just how rapid the movement from, in terms of technologies, having to, in, as recently as the mid-1980s, nobody had a private telephone, virtually nobody except high level, a small level, number of high level Communist Party officials, you basically used a neighborhood phone. So there was a collective phone that was larger than the nation, which was more, larger than the family, 
the, the household, more like um, a work unit or a neighborhood one. And then you go to individual mobile phones, cell phones for this point, which are, have just taken off. And just what that does to a sense, not so much of a group identity, but just the notion of what it means to be a, an individual in this kind of setting is just ruptured so quickly. That's a good question. Right here, then we'll go to Jennifer, and then we'll come up here. Hi, thanks everyone. My name is Christina Larson. I'm an editor at the Washington Monthly Magazine. I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the role of ethnicity in the new urban landscape in China. Um, when I was in China uh, last year, um, in the uh, Olympic theme park that's now under construction. There is a park that's devoted to the different ethnic identities. And when you walk into tourist shops, they have dolls that are dressed in Tibetan garb and garb from Yunnan province. And, and at least officially, there's this sort of happy talk celebration of different um, ethnic uh, Chinese groups, even though you know, uh, you know, the Tibetans and others don't necessarily get a good deal. But I wondered if you could talk a little bit about when this idea of celebrating different ethnic identities started and why, and to what extent the reality, you know, w what is the reality in in China cities? Good. Um, to some extent, the happy talk has been around since the founding of the the People's Republic of China, and. What you're describing of the, um, I mean, it's not so different from the political <laughs> posters, even from, of National Day celebrations from the 60s and 70s, where there would be sort of token people in colorful, it was almost always described as colorful ethnic minority garb and things like that. Um, I, I have two thoughts. One is, um, with Wei Ping's presentation in mind, <coughs> is the discrimination against migrants from the countryside has all of the characteristics that we in the United States associate with ethnic discrimination or racial discrimination, this sense of radical otherness. And in some ways, thinking about the plight of migrants from the countryside in a city like Shanghai as a thought exercise for Americans, it's much more useful to think of it as the issue of illegal, um, illegal aliens in the United States than people who've moved from one part of the country to another. Though again, thinking about repetitions, there, there was a time in the United States when being an Okie in California carried with it all of these kinds of stigmatic things. But being an outsider in a Chinese city can lead to all, I mean, you name it, the stereotypes that typically go with ethnic others of being unclean, of bringers of disease, of causers of danger, all of those, even though it's the migrate, it's people from different parts within what we think of as, as China, and even though it's not crossing the Han, non-Han ethnic group, these people can all be at some level Han. So in some ways, um, it's important to always keep in mind how powerful the rural-urban divide, and in this case, the, um, this plays into traditions of more and less civilized peoples. In the PRC, when I said it's been around, this, the happy talk has been around, there's also been talk of backwardness that's gone along with different ethnicities. And um, some of what is different now, I suppose, is like many other things, it's being commercialized more. There are groups that are playing up more ethnic difference in order to remake an impoverished area as a tourist location. Um, and the, the other thing that may be a bit different is uh, part of the search for identity or the sort of um, ennui that goes along with feeling that somehow something's gone wrong in this kind of consumer shallow society. There's a lot of romantic now uh, among some moneyed Chinese of romantic identification with the simplicity of Tibet. So there's enormous rise in tourism. Now the question is to what extent does that help keep alive some of the differences? Tibet or not. I, I think there's a very good piece in the latest New York Review of Books by Pankaj Mishra on Tibet and um, on the issue of, of Tibet and things like what the new railroad will do there and bringing people mm -hmm. there. Yeah, I just want to uh, reinforce what Jeff has said. I think the concept of ethnicity uh, to be understood in China really ought to be uh, put in a very different context, which is what the theme, one of the themes of Jeff's book is that uh, because uh, the Han makes up 
96% of the population, ethnicity takes on a very different meaning. And, and many scholars often have talked about what we call place-based ethnicity. And then that throughout history, we had that. You know, the Hakka people who are really, you know, Han, but migrated from the north to uh, Guangdong and Fujian area. They were different. They were considered different. And then the Subei people, the people from north of the Yangtze who moved to Shanghai, uh, in the early part of the 20th century were looked upon uh, very differently as sort of the, uh, uh, you know, the hillbillies. Uh, and so today migrants, but not migrants are not treated all at the same, from what areas still matter. So I guess the length through which we look at ethnicity in China uh, has to be sort of broadened. Uh, it's very much of a place-based in many ways, and, and, and so we hate to call it ethnicity, but lots of scholars say, you know, let's just call it ethnicity. But it's not the same kind of ethnicity as we call it here. Okay, I have Jennifer Turner, the woman here, the gentleman in the back, and then this gentleman here, and then we'll go over there, and that'll probably take care of it. Okay, yeah, because I direct the China Environment Forum, I want to kind of slip in a little environment in our talk on, on urban <laughs> issues, um, <coughs> specifically focus on kind of the flip side of, you said, growth and civic pride, or, or part of the civic pride issue is protests to protect the environment in your city. And the, the power for people to actually, you know, to be protesting now comes from the center. I mean, one in the environmental area, laws on um, public hearings on environmental impact assessments or the fact that an imp environmental impact assessment has to be public, you know, publicly uh, you know, acknowledged and shown to people that we had in Shaman in, in June where any, somewhere between seven and 20,000 people using text messaging took to the streets protesting the plans to build a chemical plant 14 kilometers from the city center, which was illegal. And, and I just think, you know, I want you to talk briefly about this. This is decentralization. The fact that local governments have a lot of power and they're using that power to develop their area without regard to the environment and, and the people are, are standing up. So I think that I th I'd just like to kind of comment on that or, or if you have any other kind of insights, maybe not just in the environmental sphere where you are seeing this kind of protest growth in China mm. in urban areas. Um. A couple of things. I think that the potential for protest is both um, created by some of what the center does, but I think also some of what we see with environmental protests is um, what I see as the post-1989 new social contract that the Communist Party, it, it was never formally ratified, but essentially made with the people, which was that if you let us keep running things, we'll give you more freedom in all sorts of other realms more choices in all sorts of other realms other, except the political one. The students of Tiananmen and the other protesters were demanding an increase in freedoms. And they had many different things on their agenda. It wasn't primarily or only democratic elections. It was about private, not interfering with your private life, allowing you to have a good life, defined in all sorts of ways. So I think what you see with some of the environment protests or the locale-based protests is people who feel that, that the government isn't living up to this part of it. They're not having more choices if suddenly the government is saying, is, is seizing their land to build a, a new power plant, or is limiting the quality of their life in order to serve some, some extra local desire. So you have a lot of that. And it, a lot of things work very contradictorily. I mean, Shanghai now has better parks in the main part of the city. It's, it's a greener city in, in the center. But being able to live in the center is something that comes with money. And so the, the most ironic story about this, I thought, that John Giddings covered when they were built, ready for the Apex Summit in Pudong, they built a beautiful new park so that people, the world leaders coming there would see that Pudong wasn't all about high rises, it was also about a park. So people were relocated who lived in the land that was going to be made the park. And they were given, quote, unquote, better housing, but it would be far enough away from the center of the city, the more desirable, even the more desirable part of Pudong, that they wouldn't actually be able to use this park that was created there. So there was discontent. So there's been, and there's discontent. You could see another example of this, the fight to save the Beijing, um, the Beijing Hutong lifestyle. And so the government is being made to negotiate for these because it's something that the government says it it believes in, the government still keeps winning, though. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's like so many things, a double-edged sword. 
Okay, we're beginning to run out of time, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take two questions. This woman, and I believe the, the gentleman in the back had a question, or there's a hand, yeah. And then we'll come back up here, and then we'll take the final, what will be the there final. There was one up questions. here also, yeah. yeah. I'm Barbara Pillsbury, working as a consultant with various international organizations. And my question concerns your statement about the increasing pride in local places in China. And you illustrated that speaking about Beijing and Shanghai, which of course are very exceptional local places um, with predominance both in China and globally. But what about places like Lanzhou or Kunming or Xining or Yinchuan? Um, would you find they're the same kind of burgeoning local pride. And then when you try to dissect what is this local pride, then of course we know that many of those cities are vying for tourists to increase their revenues. And so how do you measure a, local, a sense of local pride, which is distinct from the commercial desire to increase the coffers of the city? Before you answer, we'll take that gentleman. And did the woman in the very corner had it back there have a question too? We'll take both those and we'll answer all three. Uh, I'm Jim Feinerman from Georgetown University Law Center. I just wanted to uh, mention something that uh, seems surprising and not being uh, raised uh, sooner, and that's the question of linguistic uh, disparity. I mean, one of the things about both Beijing and Shanghai is that there are native dialects uh, of both of those places, and they're very influential in establishing a sense of local identity. And of course, in China, among the migrant population, one of the things that immediately marks you as an outsider uh, is the fact that you don't speak the local dialect. And even in a place like Japan, where you know between, say, Kansai and, and Edo, there's, there's differences that are dialectal. They're, they're nothing like the differences between the dialects and Chinese, which linguists would say are essentially separate languages. Uh, and a, a, as a result, the, the local identity that's really formed uh, as a result of those local variations, uh, even, you know, in, in neighborhoods in cities like Beijing or in Guangzhou, you know, the people who live in Toisan speak a different Cantonese than the people who live in urban Guangzhou, and they speak a different language than the Hakka uh, or the people who live in, in Chaozhou. Uh, th those sorts of things, I think, really do uh, attest to a survival of a significant amount of localism that really doesn't exist in very many other places uh, anywhere around the world. And the woman behind you, quickly. Uh, Ina Konopleva from Cato Institute. Um, I was in Beijing last year and I noticed that it changes very fast. Like new developments, new buildings, like they grow really fast. And uh, I compared the U.S. and China and in U.S. we don't have these feelings that the changes environment so fast. So I would like to come back to the question of interest in local history. Is it possible <laughs> because the Chinese environment changes so fast, they would like to capture a moment and there is a f some kind of feeling of lost? Okay, three, three questions, quick answers, and then we'll pick up the last two. Great. Um, yes, there is local pride in, in these other settings too, I think, and sometimes, but how you separate that out from sort of strategic efforts to um, bring in tourist dollars from others. I think there is, and there's also a hierarchy of local identities. There are local identities that people strive to claim, and I mean, Shanghai being one of them, and I just think it's such a strange phenomenon. I've got to describe it briefly. There's a businessman from outside of Shanghai, Hangzhou, who's now resettled in Shanghai, and he's now claiming himself. It's always been like Angelino's Shanghainese, being Shanghainese is something you can claim fairly quickly because it's the idea is it was a city of, of migrants always so the newcomer can claim it. He's now bought Shanghai Island in Dubai, an artificially created island outside of Dubai, which he's transforming into, which is an islands of the world um, theme park writ large, which he's now creating a, Shanghai, a miniature Shanghai with some miniature versions of the buildings Shanghai and a river running through the island. Anyway, um, but this is his way of showing I'm now, I'm already Shanghainese. Fit, fitting with, with language, there's an ongoing debate with, with Shanghai identity at one level is speaking Shanghainese. Then there's always a debate on who really speaks Shanghainese and whether that's the root of it. And then the city is so defined by incoming um, merchant class that when the takeoff, it's always been a city with many more people from outside than from within inside. The um, saying now in Shanghai is that there's a linguistic topography to the city, which is eerily in some ways like you know, under the concession system. In the center of the city, you speak English. English is the, is the, is the language, the lingua franca. 
Outside that, in a bit of a core, the, the lingua franca is Mandarin, Putonghua. And then it's only on the outside that the, sh the real Shanghainese. So this is an idea of the real Shanghainese being relegated to the outside. So this strategic use of the local identity can end up disprivileging the locals, which again, you know, this is not a ex purely exotically uh, um, Chinese story. Again, with Los Angeles, you can say where is Spanish speak spoken versus English. And then um, the rapidity of change and the desire for something to hold on to in that, I think, I think that would be a really interesting thing to study comparatively and historically. I mean, was there a revival of this kind of local um, interest and interest in tradition during times of rapid change? And I think there is a case to be made that it's true, that the, the, the burst of energy in, um, in sort of local history and in folklore came in the West at the period of the Industrial Revolution or in the French Revolution where there was a period of a sense of this kind of rapidly changing world. Um, but we've often felt that we're living in rapidly changing times. So I think that would be something we would want to um, study uh, comparatively. But certainly that's some element of it because the speed with which Chinese cities are changing, it's just, it's just staggering. The way in which, I mean, I, I go back to Western cities that I visited before in the past and I never have the sense that this is just totally disorienting as going back to Shanghai after a couple of years. And, and locals feel that way too. Okay, this gentleman here and this gentleman, and we'll wrap the, up. Uh, Dave Rabinowitz, I was wondering if you could compare the development of the Chinese cities, Beijing, Shanghai and such, with the ethnically Chinese city of Singapore. Okay, and this gentleman right here. <laughs> uh, Robin Rajak with the World Bank. Um, just two quick things. We talked a lot about nostalgia. I just wondered who's nostalgia? The people who are, um, the mi 150 migrants, are they still stuck in the 1950s as reality with no escape? And therefore, there is no room for nostalgia. Um, and related to the, the migrants, the permit system, is that effectively, um, how difficult is that making for people to identify with a city, whether or not you get a residence permit? Um, Singapore is a, is, is a fascinating example. Singapore is certainly trying to use, has tried in different ways. To, there's now a big ad campaign of Singapore of sort of we invented this Asian miracle and laying claim to it. I think there are lots of interesting comparisons and um, ways to think about it. Singapore, um, I think there were positive and negative learning experiences from it. I think there was a conscious decision to try to preserve more of old Shanghai in part because there was relatively little of old Singapore left so that it was for a kind of self-conscious tourist industry that would play on a past. But I think it's a great, it's an enormous question. It's worthy of its own session. <laughs> um, but I could talk to you some afterwards about that as well. And you're right. I mean, that t I, though this goes back to Jordan's question of whether nostalgia is partly uh, a luxury. And I think, you know, in some ways, clearly it is. And I, but I think there can be very real, there are multiple kinds of nostalgia. It may not be nostalgia for, for a city or a place. I mean, you've, there's a kind of nostalgia, very pragmatic, very understandable, when a laid off worker from a state run industry who thought he had a job for life under Mao carries a Mao portrait through the street. They have a very specific kind of nostalgia for a period that's no longer there, a security. And they carry a Mao of a certain age, a sort of a young Mao making the promises, not necessarily the Cultural Revolution Mao unleashing chaos. It, for them, Mao represents a kind of, ironically, a kind of stability in their lives that's no longer there. So yes, it's very important. And uh, yeah. registration, I'm not so good on. Um, in smaller cities, household registration doesn't really matter anymore, really. Uh, since 2005, even in large cities, uh, you can stay forever, really. Um, but it's when you try to access uh, public education for your children and uh, housing, uh, certain types of housing, particularly affordable housing, that's where you come uh, with problem. But if you have money, you can buy everything today. Okay. You can buy uh, an enrollment place for your children in public schools, but you have to pay. And health care is pretty much privatized, and so it's no problem. Housing, the commercial sector is completely open, so there's no problem, but affordable housing sector is completely closed in large cities to migrants. Jeff, I have one final question, which is tied to my Russian experience, and you use the nice neutral term uh, strategic. Um, 
uh, the term that comes to my mind may be cynical. Um, and the reason for that has to do with the fact that um, uh, going to school in, in Leningrad in the mid-1970s and writing a, a book in the late Soviet period about Leningrad politics, I followed a group of people who used Leningrad identity as a way of busting open the Soviet system. And um, in fact, one of them who went on to have a, a rather prominent national political career until she was assassinated in, uh, in, in the late 1990s said to me, well, Blair, nobody in Moscow would let us advance. So if we could advance Leningrad, we could ad advance ourselves. What becomes interesting about that is this is a group of people that now runs Russia. Mm -hmm. All the senior positions in the Russian government, for the most part, are filled by people from Leningrad from this period who then were great Democrats and great decentralizers and now sitting someplace else in the Kremlin become great centralizers and authoritarians. Mm -hmm. How much of this would disappear if the rules of the game changed? That's, that's a great question and I think it's also we need to think in our own case of how major political shifts can alter the balance between real and imagined local identities. Being a New Yorker meant something very different the day after 9-11 than the day before in the sense of what people outside of New York thought about New Yorkers, how they did, that this was something that could shift in that way. I think there are things about the Shanghai identity that can be used, of course, to argue for a more cosmopolitan um, vision of China in terms of engagement with the world. It also can be used to argue for a much more kind of crassly materialistic um, authoritarian consumerist mm -hmm. version and both of those and this maybe brings back to Singapore as Singapore can be held up then as a model of some extent and it has been and different points of you know all the goodies but just not that those certain things of freedom of speech and and that brings back to the sort of um, theme of the book which was using not that not that China has stopped being a place that some parts of 1984 can be used to help us understand but the brave new world image is one that I think we also should should think about as a value of what keeps people from um, from taking to the streets is partly the government keeping them distracted, keeping them, I mean, so local identity can be something that fills a gap left by the government, but can also be something that keeps people from thinking about being in the same boat as people in other locales. One of the amazing things with Tiananmen, people in all different areas, urbanites, poured out. They saw themselves as in essentially the same predicament as urbanites in Beijing. They felt an immediate kind of kinship to it. One of the things about local identity is it can become a check on the swelling across borders of expressions of discontent. So in a cynical way, mm -hmm. if I were the leaders of the Communist Party, I wouldn't be so worried about the fragmenting potential of, of local identities because some fragmentation can help you ride out the kinds of dilemmas that the non-fragmented um, parts of Eastern Bloc nations, I think, fell very quickly in part because of the way they could swell. On that note, I'm going to thank our speakers. I want to thank Jordan for coming across town and Wiping for coming up I-95 and, and Jeffrey for uh, bringing his wonderful book here. And again,